Hey y'all, now that we know a little bit about group theory, it's time to talk about primality testing. So in this short video, we'll talk about a brief history of primality testing and also about Fermat's test. So prime numbers, you know what prime numbers are. They're like two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, 11, 13, 17, and so on. These are numbers that have no divisors except themselves and one. And it turns out that prime numbers are really useful. First, lots of algorithms only work modulo a prime, not modulo composite numbers. This is due to the fact that, as we saw in the previous video about groups, modulos mod the prime have nice algebraic properties. Primes are especially useful in cryptography. For example, RSA encryption requires really big random secret primes. Here, really big means like at least 128 bits long. That means it's important to be able to generate random primes on the fly. Fortunately, there are lots of primes. Uh, there are infinitely many of them, and moreover, they're pretty dense in the integers. For example, there's a theorem that says that for all large enough numbers n, the number of primes less than n, which is denoted pi of n, satisfies this equation. That is to say, pi of n is basically on the order of n divided by log n, uh, you know, plus or minus 2 or 4. A corollary of this is that if you were to pick a random number between 1 and 2 to the 128, so a random 128-bit number, that number is going to be prime with probability at least 1 over 100, or even better if you make sure not to pick the even ones, for example. This is good news because it means that the problem of generating big random primes basically reduces to the problem of just deciding whether or not a given number is prime. This is the problem of primality testing. Given a number n, is it prime? There's a straightforward algorithm for primality testing. Just try all of the numbers up to square root n. Check if they divide n. If any of them do, then n is not prime. Otherwise, if you can't find any divisors of n, then n is prime. This algorithm works, but it's not efficient. So you might be wondering, why isn't this efficient? This seems like it's going to run in polynomial time in n. Isn't that what we wanted? This is a natural thought, but if you are wondering this, I encourage you to pause the video for a second now to think about it. So the problem is that the size of the input isn't actually n, but rather it's log n, the number of bits required to write down n. So for example, if we were to choose n, a 128-bit number, so n between 1 and 2 to the 128, then the square root of n is equal to 2 to the 64, which is still an extremely large number. So checking all 2 to the 64 numbers between 1 and square root n is going to be prohibitively expensive. On the other hand, the number of bits needed to write down n is only 128. So perhaps we could get an algorithm that runs in time polynomial in 128 rather than 2 to the 64. So really what we're after here is an algorithm that runs in time poly log n rather than polynomial in n. So people have been thinking about primality testing for a long time. Starting as long ago as 200 BCE, Aristosthenes described the prime number sieve, which is basically a fancy version of the trial division algorithm we saw before. This is as an algorithm for finding all the primes up to a certain number. Then some time passed, and in the intervening centuries, a bunch of people also thought about testing for primes, but no one came up with an algorithm that was both efficient and also worked for any number n until the 1970s. So in 1976, Miller and Rabin gave an efficient randomized algorithm for testing if a number is prime, and this algorithm is still used today. The Miller-Rabin test is a Monte Carlo algorithm, which is always correct on primes, and it's probably correct on composites. In 1977, Solovey and Strassen gave an alternate randomized algorithm with similar properties, also still in use today. And about 10 years later, Edelman and Huang gave yet another randomized algorithm. This one is always correct on composites and probably correct on primes. And at this point, it might be a good exercise to think about how to take these two algorithms, one of which is always correct on primes, probably correct on composites, and the other of which is always correct on composites, probably correct on primes, and turn it into a Las Vegas algorithm that is always correct on all of the numbers but only probably efficient. Moving forward in time, in 1999, Agrawal and Biswas gave a randomized algorithm based on Fermat's little theorem for polynomials, which we saw in the previous video.
In 2002, Agarwal, Kyle, and Saxena de-randomized that 1999 algorithm, and that finally gave the first efficient deterministic algorithm for primality testing. So this long history of primality testing illustrates why we are talking about primality testing as a nice example in a randomized algorithms class. It took over 25 years to go from an efficient randomized algorithm to an efficient deterministic algorithm. So this is a great example where a randomized algorithm can be much simpler and easier to find than a deterministic one. So what we're going to do for the rest of this short video is to talk about a primality test that folks sort of in these intervening centuries were thinking about, which doesn't quite work. However, it will introduce an idea that will be useful when we talk about the Miller-Rabin test in a later video. The test that we're going to see now is based on Fermat's Little Theorem. So recall, in the last video about group theory, we saw Fermat's Little Theorem, which says that if n is prime, then for all x in zn star, x to the n minus 1 is equivalent to 1 mod n. This naturally leads to the idea of a test for prime numbers. Basically, we're going to choose some number x in 1 through n minus 1 uniformly at random. Then we're going to check, does x to the n minus 1 equal 1 mod n? If so, we're going to output prime. If indeed n is prime, this will always be correct, because Fermat's little theorem, which I've copied up here, says that that's always going to hold for any x you choose. On the other hand, if this does not hold for this particular random x, we're going to say composite. So as we just said, if the number n is prime, this test is always going to say so. But what happens if n is not prime? In that case, this test doesn't always work. So recall from the previous video that the Carmichael numbers are composite numbers n, so that for all x in Zn star, x to the n minus 1 is equivalent to 1 mod n. That means that for a Carmichael number n, this algorithm will always return prime, but by definition, Carmichael numbers are composite, so the algorithm will always be wrong. And we said in the previous video that there are infinitely many Carmichael numbers. So that's not great news, that means this test is going to fail on infinitely many numbers. However, it turns out that the test works well if n is not a Carmichael number. So here's a theorem. The theorem says that if n is composite but not a Carmichael number, then the probability that Fermat's algorithm outputs composite is at least one half. And as we've seen before, we can always boost this success probability arbitrarily close to one by repetition. So here's a quick proof. We're going to break this up into two cases. Case one is when the GCD of n and x is not equal to one, that is when n and x are not relatively prime. In this case, I claim that x to the n minus one is not equivalent to one mod n. To see this, note that if x to the n minus one were equivalent to one mod n, then what that means is that we can write x to the n minus 1 is equal to c times n plus 1 for some number c. And we note that the GCD of x and n divides this side by definition of GCD. It also divides this. And if the GCD is not equal to 1, then it can't divide a number and also that number plus 1, so it does not divide this. So that means that the GCD of x and n divides the left-hand side but not the right-hand side, which is a contradiction. Thus, in case one, the algorithm is always going to say composite, and it will be correct. Case two is when the GCD of n and x is equal to one. In this case, let h be the set of x's, so that x is in Zn star, and x to the n minus one is equivalent to one mod n. You can check that h is a subgroup of Zn star. Further, h is not equal to Zn star because we said that n was not a Carmichael number. That means that there's at least one x so that x to the n minus 1 is not equal to 1 mod n. Now recall from the previous video that Lagrange's theorem implies that the size of h divides the size of Zn star, which in particular implies that the size of h is at most 1 half times the size of Zn star. But this implies that the x that picked in Fermat's algorithm is not in h with probability at least a half. And h is exactly the set of x's so that Fermat's algorithm is going to say prime. Therefore, the probability that the algorithm says composite is at least a half. And this proves the theorem. So this shows that Fermat's test 
works on many numbers. It works well for all numbers n that are not Carmichael numbers. So while Fermat's test is pretty neat, it doesn't actually work for all numbers n. In our next class meeting, we'll see an algorithm that does work for all numbers n. So see you then.